Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers vehicle searches, excessive force, and resisting, and is brought to us by Lackluster's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. Before we dive into the interaction, I want to give a big thanks to the sponsor of this episode, Morgan & Morgan. In December of 2022, there were over 284 million vehicles operating across the country, and in 2020 alone, there were over 5 million car accidents in the U.S with over 1.5 million of those accidents resulting in injuries, and over 3.6 million resulting in property damage. This means that the average driver in the U.S. will experience three to four car accidents in their lifetime. Many of these accidents will involve insurance claims, lawsuits, and tons of paperwork. Luckily, Morgan & Morgan is here to help in these difficult situations. Not only is Morgan & Morgan America's largest injury law firm, with over 900 attorneys operating in over 100 offices across the entire country, but they have developed the simplest and most intuitive way to seek the compensation you deserve. Many people have the impression that hiring an attorney is a daunting task full of endless paperwork, meetings, and research. But the legal experts at Morgan & Morgan have modernized the injury law process so you can submit a claim and communicate with your legal team all from your phone. With Morgan & Morgan, there's no need for you to visit law offices and sit through long consultations. You can submit a claim and have a lawyer review your case with only eight clicks on your phone. And the best part is, you only pay if they win. There are no upfront costs, sign-up fees, or hidden invoices. If they don't win your case, you pay nothing. Over 3 million people trust Morgan & Morgan to help in their time of need every year. And with over 4,000 support staff available at any hour to help with your case, you can submit a claim anytime. If you're ever injured in an accident, you can submit a claim at www.forthepeople.com slash audit the audit, or by dialing pound law. That's pound 529 on your phone. Thanks again to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring today's episode. In the late evening of December 3rd, 2021, Officer Teddy Dyer, Officer Candace Miller, and Sergeant David Myrick of the East Ridge Police Department in Tennessee responded to a call for a well child check at the residence of Haley Sherrard. When they arrived at the home, they found Haley's mother, Angel Sherrard, along with her son, Devin, in a vehicle in front of the house. Officer Dyer approached the vehicle from the right passenger side, and the encounter that followed was captured on his body camera. Hello. Hey, what's up? Hey, do you live here? Um, my daughter's living here. Is she? In, yeah. the, in this, is that 893? Yeah, it is. Right, hang on one second for me, okay? Something wrong? Well, we got called to check on a child. What well, child? I don't know. They didn't tell us. They just said do a welfare check. From when? Like, what do they say? I don't know. We'll go up and knock. Is that your daughter coming now? Yeah. What's her name? Hey, going up to the door. Well, how old is the child? Two years old. Is there a two-year-old that lives here? Okay. I bet it was, uh... Four mic three, seven golf four. Why are you running my tag? Because I smell marijuana. You smell marijuana? Yes. Because you smell marijuana that gives you the right to run my tag? Not only that, I'm going to search car. You're not going to search anything. Yes, ma'am. No, you're not. I promise you. You are and not going to break my only, rights right now. You're about to get your rights in the back of my car. Well, it's, that's what you want to do because you, you're going to get in trouble when you do. Because I haven't done anything. I haven't violated to any rules or anything. You just sit there and talk to me and, and to that talk I, to me. You're going to search I, my car. I am going to search your car. And you're running my tag. I am going to search your car. I'm not doing anything to sitting out here waiting for I my daughter care. to come back I out. don't care. Your car is going to be searched. And if you interfere with my search, I will put you in the car okay, and I will take you to jail. Okay, you go ahead and you violate my rights then. Okay, put Let's your hands do on that. the car. You violate my rights. Put your hands on the car. Officer Dyer claims he is going to run the vehicle's tags and search it because he smells marijuana. Tennessee is one of the minority of states that, as of the date of writing this episode, have not legalized or decriminalized either recreational or medical marijuana, although the state has legalized hemp and CBD oil. Accordingly, in the 1976 case of State v. Hughes, the Supreme Court of Tennessee held that the odor of marijuana coming from a vehicle constitutes probable cause to believe that the vehicle contains contraband marijuana. In the 2022 case of State v. Hampton, the Court of Criminal Appeals of Tennessee rejected an argument that, with the legalization of hemp, the quote-unquote plain smell of marijuana no longer established probable cause for a warrantless vehicle search, as the smell of marijuana is indistinguishable from the smell of hemp, concluding that, now quoting, until our Supreme Court or our legislature determines otherwise, the smell of marijuana can continues to establish probable cause for the warrantless search of an automobile. According
Accordingly, if a court believed Officer Dyer's assertion that he smelled marijuana, it is highly likely that it would determine he had the probable cause necessary to search Ms. Sherrard's vehicle. Now, as to the constitutionality of running Ms. Sherrard's tags, courts have consistently concluded that officers do not violate the Fourth Amendment by searching for an individual's license plate in a police database, even when they do not have any reason to suspect any sort of criminality. As the Supreme Court explained in the 1986 case of New York v. Class, quote, A citizen does not surrender all the protections of the Fourth Amendment by entering an automobile. Nonetheless, the state's intrusion into a particular area, whether in an automobile or elsewhere, cannot result in a Fourth Amendment violation unless the area is one in which there is a constitutionally protected reasonable expectation of privacy. The court then held that an officer did not violate the Fourth Amendment by reaching into the passenger compartment of a vehicle stopped for a traffic violation to move papers obscuring its vehicle identification number, or VIN, or VIN, reasoning that individuals do not have reasonable expectations of privacy in their VINs, as they are required by law to be located in a place ordinarily in plain view from the exterior of the automobile. Applying this and other precedents, courts have generally concluded that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy in a license plate number, and that officers may therefore run tags of a vehicle in plain view without implicating the Fourth Amendment. For instance, in the 2006 case of U.S. v. Ellison, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over Tennessee, determined that, quote, so long as the officer had a right to be in a position to observe the defendant's license plate, any such observation and corresponding use of the information on the plate does not violate the Fourth Amendment. As such, a court would almost certainly find that Officer Dyer was within his constitutional authority to run Ms. Sherrard's plates, regardless of whether or not he actually smelled any marijuana. Yo, what are you You're gonna put- you're, you're I arresting said put me? your hands on the car! You're arresting me for Put what? your hand back up! Hey, don't you put your f***ing hands up! Hey, no, 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 Get in the car! Get nothing. in the car! Oh my god, I can't! I'm too big! Sucks to be you! Stop Get in the car! I didn't get do in. anything! You're a woman! You're gonna treat me like this? You're gonna get tased! Get in the car! Listen. Get in the car! Get in the car! I'm getting in the car! Okay, I'm in! I'm in! Although it is difficult to tell exactly what happened from the body camera footage, and Lackluster reported that the other officer's body camera footage had been quote-unquote purged, Ms. Sherrard's attorney detailed the officer's use of force against her in a federal lawsuit stemming from this encounter. According to the complaint, Officer Dyer grabbed Ms. Sherrard, slammed her face onto the partially opened window of her vehicle, banged her head onto her vehicle, and handcuffed her. The lawsuit also asserts that Officer Dyer then pushed her against the back of a police vehicle and jerked her head backward by grabbing her hair after she had been handcuffed. A few moments later, after Ms. Sherrard was escorted to the police vehicle, Officer Anna Simmons arrived on the scene, and Sergeant Myrick quote-unquote drive-stunned Ms. Sherrard with her taser as she struggled to get in the vehicle. The term drive-stun refers to holding a taser device against the target without firing the projectiles, which is intended to cause pain, but not incapacitation. Despite the fact that Ms. Sherrard explicitly told the officers that she did not believe she was able to get into the back of the vehicle due to her size, Officer Simmons chose to leave this fact out of her police report, which Lackluster obtained and included in his video. According to Officer Simmons' narrative, now quoting, Sherrard was escorted to the police unit, however, continued her refusal of compliance and would not get in the vehicle. Police continued to give numerous lawful orders to get in the police unit, and she did not comply. Police drive-stunned Sherrard to gain compliance, which was successful. Now, as we've discussed before here on ATA, whether or not the use of force during an arrest or investigatory stop of a free citizen is quote-unquote excessive, is analyzed under the so-called reasonableness standard of the Fourth Amendment, which guarantees citizens the right to be secure in their persons against unreasonable seizures of the person. As the Supreme Court explained in the landmark 1989 case of Graham v. Connor, although, now quoting, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence has long recognized that the right to make an arrest or investigatory stop necessarily carries with it the right to use some degree of physical coercion or threat thereof to affect it, any use of force must be reasonable 
reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. In the Graham case, the court noted that, quote, the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight, and ultimately identified three factors that courts should consider when evaluating the constitutionality of a use of force, stating that, now quoting, because the test of reasonableness under the Fourth Amendment is not capable of precise definition or mechanical application, its proper application requires careful attention to the facts and circumstances of each particular case, including the severity of the crime at issue, whether the suspect poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others, and whether he is actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. Applying the three so-called Graham factors to Ms. Sherrard's arrest, she would have a strong argument that the officers used excessive force in conducting the arrest and in tasing her when she struggled to get into the vehicle, as it is unclear for what crime she was even arrested for in the first place. And although it is possible that she struggled some against the officer's use of force against her, she was not actively resisting or posing a safety threat to the officers when she was tased or slammed into the vehicle. Additionally, even if Ms. Sherrard did struggle during her arrest, she would still have a legitimate argument that pulling her hair after she was handcuffed and banging her head against the car was excessive. Back Shut up. the f up before I take your to jail too. You know Get back. She just got. Well, run after baby. You do not go away. Arrest her. Girl, do not push me. What is wrong with you? Who did it? I need to know who did it. Who did what? Who tased my? She mama? didn't get tased. Get tased. Then why was her taser going off over there? Checking the fire, I guess. So then why was there a taser? How about you worry about you? That's we'll worry about, about your mama. mama. I don't really give a. Sh violating our rights right now. What, which one? You want to act like a big girl? You're going to get treated oh, like a big girl. Right so I drive stunned her mom to get her in the car. Uh, and that, she's perfectly fine. Just drive stunned? I'm just making sure. Yeah, no, she's... She, just drive stunned. Yeah, I, I... But I did it twice. I'm emotionally invested. Can I take her? Yes. Well, we, <laughs> we, we were thinking. <laughs> I love it when you do this. <laughs> going to the hospital, I'm going to come. I'm talking. I'm, ta I'm telling you what's going to happen, okay? You're very rude. Taking mom for disorderly. Conduct, resistance, stop, halt, frisk. They are now so Officer Dyer states that he is taking Ms. Sherrard to jail for disorderly conduct and resisting. Under Section 39-17-305 of the Tennessee Code, quote, A person commits an offense who, in a public place and with intent to cause public annoyance or alarm, engages in fighting or in violent or threatening behavior, refuses to obey an official order to disperse issued to maintain public safety in dangerous proximity to a fire, hazard, or other emergency, or creates a hazardous or physically offensive condition by any act that serves no legitimate purpose. Further, the statute states that, now quoting again, a person also violates this section who makes unreasonable noise that prevents others from carrying on lawful activities. In this instance, Ms. Sherrard's actions did not appear to rise to the level of disorderly conduct because, although she spoke assertively, she did not even raise her voice at Officer Dyer until right before he grabbed her, and certainly did not make unreasonable noise, engage in fighting, violent, or threatening behavior, or or create a hazardous or physically offensive condition. In fact, Officer Dyer's voice was noticeably louder and more aggressive than Ms. Sherrard's was. I promise you. You are not going to break my only, rights right now. You're about to get your rights in the back of my car. You're, you're I said, put me? your hands on the car. You're arresting me for Put what? your hand back up. Hey, don't you put your. In her police report, Officer Simmons summarized the encounter differently, stating that after Ms. Sherrard was informed her vehicle would be searched, quote, Sherrard became belligerent with police, screaming and yelling that the police were not going to search the vehicle. Sherrard continued to scream and yell, causing even further disorder. Now, while the behavior described in the police report could potentially support a disorderly conduct conviction, based on the body camera footage of what actually occurred, it seems unlikely that a court would find that Ms. Sherrard could be convicted of disorderly conduct conduct, or that her arrest was even supported by probable cause. As to the resisting charge, according to section 39-16-602 of the Tennessee Code, quote, it is an offense for a person to intentionally prevent or obstruct anyone known to the person to be a law enforcement officer from effecting a stop, frisk, halt, arrest, or search of any person by using force against the law enforcement officer. Although the statute requires an individual to use force against a law enforcement officer, section 39-11-106 of the Tennessee Code 
code states that, quote, force means compulsion by the use of physical power or violence and shall be broadly construed to accomplish the purposes of this title. And in the 1997 case of State v. Isabor, the Court of Criminal Appeals of Tennessee determined that an individual's actions in flailing his arms and struggling in an effort to avoid being handcuffed were sufficient to support a resisting conviction. Accordingly, if Ms. Sherrard physically struggled against the officer's attempts to arrest her, she could potentially be convicted of resisting. However, while the resisting statute also states that, now quoting, except as provided in section 39-11-611, it is no defense to prosecution under this section that the stop, frisk, halt, arrest, or search was unlawful, section 39-11-611 of the Tennessee Code allows individuals to use force in self-defense during an arrest when, now quoting, the law enforcement officer uses greater force than necessary to make the arrest, and the person using force reasonably believes that the force is immediately necessary to protect against the law enforcement officer's use of greater force than necessary. In other words, as the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals explained in the 2007 case of Roberts v. Anderson, quote, Under Tennessee law, an officer's excessive use of force is a defense to a charge of resisting or evading arrest. Accordingly, while Tennessee allows individuals to be convicted of resisting an arrest that is not supported by probable cause, Ms. Sherrard would be able to attempt to defend herself against any resisting charge by arguing that the officers were using excessive force. But it could just, the car can just stay here. I mean, I'm we'll her see. daughter. I, and I please see. don't, like, it's already, like, please don't, because, like, I Let's want to out of jail, and I just want to uh, and I'm and I feel for you, and I'm not trying to cause you no headache. You just got to understand, we have a job to do. Also, step out. Let's talk. How old are you, man? I'm 18, sir. 18. Mm -hmm. And I'm a man. I'm like you. Why you got to hit my mama like that, bro? You gonna keep the? All right, I tried. I tried. You see, I tried to I'm talk to you like a man. I tried to talk. Why you got to do her like that, bro? Get in the car. Like, I tried. I tried to talk to you. I tried. I tried. I'm not your bro. You see, I tried. You okay. see, I tried to talk to you. How old are you? 18. He's old enough to take a ride. He goes to the big boy jail. Listen, I want you to know how this would have went. Ma'am, I'm gonna have to search your car. Okay. I didn't find anything. Guess what? Have a good night. After Ms. Sherrard's arrest, the officers searched her vehicle and found no marijuana or any illegal contraband. They also conducted the well child check and found the child in question healthy and happy inside the home. Ms. Sherrard was transported by EMS to a hospital where she was medically cleared and then charged with disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. The officers released Haley and Angel's 15-year-old daughter, who had been handcuffed during the encounter, but Devin was charged with disorderly conduct. On April 19, 2022, the state of Tennessee dismissed all charges against Angel and Devin. On July 12, 2022, Angel, Devin, and her minor daughter filed a lawsuit in state court, and the case was removed to federal court on August 11, 2022. The lawsuit alleged multiple constitutional violations and state law tort claims against the individual officers involved in the encounter, as well as the city of East Ridge. On September 21, 2023, the Sherrards reached a settlement agreement with East Ridge. Although the amount received by the adult Sherrards has not been disclosed, due to Tennessee laws requiring requiring court approval of settlements and legal fees for minors, we know that Ms. Sherrard's minor daughter received a settlement of $10,000, with $4,000 of that sum being paid to her attorney. Now, although the population of East Ridge is less than 22,000, the Sherrard's lawsuit is not the only civil rights case that has recently been filed against the city alleging police misconduct, including a case where Officer Dyer is accused of using excessive force against a citizen, and Officer Miller is accused of failing to intervene, and another lawsuit alleging that Officer Simmons used excessive of force in preventing a patient from leaving a hospital. On December 22, 2022, the East Ridge Police Department fired Officer Simmons for so-called use of force and so-called discourteous behavior during another encounter. On December 29, 2022, it was confirmed that Officer Simmons had been hired by the Bradley County Sheriff's Office less than a week after her termination, as she was reported as the department's first responding officer to a car accident on Christmas Day. In May of 2023, Officer Simmons resigned from the Bradley County Sheriff's Office for undisclosed reasons. No disciplinary action has been publicly reported for the other officers involved in the encounter with the Sherrards. Overall, the East Ridge officers get an F.
for using unnecessary force against Ms. Sherrard, blatantly misrepresenting Ms. Sherrard's conduct during the encounter in an apparent attempt to manufacture criminality and justify their actions, and seeming to take pleasure in subjecting Ms. Sherrard to both physical abuse and emotionally demeaning behavior. Officer Simmons, in particular, seemed to relish misusing her authority, telling Ms. Sherrard, and I quote, sucks to be you, when she revealed that she could not fit in the backseat of the police vehicle, and openly admitting that she was quote-unquote emotionally invested in seeing Ms. Sherrard be processed, despite the fact that she had not committed any crimes. There are too many issues with the officer's behavior in this encounter for us to discuss all of them, but on the whole, they remained unprofessional, aggressive, and cruel throughout the interaction, and likely violated the constitutional rights of all of the present members of the Sherrard family. Ms. Sherrard gets an A-, minus because while she was mistaken about the legality of Officer Dyer's decision to run her tags, she opposed a potential potentially illegal search of her vehicle, fought the charges against her in court, and took proper legal action against the officers after the encounter. Although the search of her vehicle may have been lawful if Officer Dyer actually smelled marijuana, given the clear lack of honesty in the way the East Ridge PD represented other aspects of the encounter, and the absence of marijuana in the vehicle, it is more than plausible that Officer Dyer was simply lying about the odor, which would make the search clearly unconstitutional. Beyond that, the physical force and verbal abuse that Ms. Sherrard and her family were subjected to during this altercation was inexcusable, and I commend the Sherrards for filing a lawsuit to attempt to hold these officers accountable for their reprehensible actions. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic that you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.